welcome everybody to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I got a great one for you today. I'm learning all about liquid biopsy. It's a new uh, diagnostic tool that honestly I did not know much about until very, very recently. I've been hearing a lot about it. I've been seeing uh, lecture tracks uh, on uh, at vet conferences. I've been uh, seeing articles coming out and started reading about them. I'm like, man, this is, this is really, really interesting. And so I am so thrilled that Dr. Andy Flory, a uh, boarded veterinary oncologist, is on. She is uh, from Pet DX and she's talking to me all about liquid biopsy, how it works, why it works, when to use it, uh, what the benefits are of early cancer detection, what type of sensitivity and specificity from this test we can expect, the cost of the test, all the things that you need to know if you're interested in trying this out in your practice. But guys, I just, I just tell you, I'm excited about this. I love the idea of catching cancer uh, really early and being able to do more about it. And so anyway, I'm enthused. I want you guys to check this out. I hope that you will be as excited as I am. This episode is made possible ad-free by Pet DX. Guys, let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to cone of shame with dr andy rourke welcome to the podcast dr andy flurry thanks for being here thank you so much for having me one andy to another really lovely to be here i know a couple of andy's hanging out talking to each other it's it's a great thing yes uh, for those people who don't know you i want to share uh, a coupling of your uh, a couple of your bona fides here because you have done a lot of things and you are wildly impressive you went to vet school at the ohio state university you did your residency at cornell you are a boarded uh, uh, veterinary oncologist, uh, internal metals, medicine specialist in, our, in oncology. You uh, practice at the AMC in New York City. You practice in Australia and then also at the vet specialty hospital in San Diego. One of the things that I'm most impressed with you is you tend to be involved in internship and residency programs. I see you as co-directors of those programs and you have a, a background in teaching. You've also done a ton of research on cancer early diagnosis, uh, cancer testing, uh, developing treatment pr- plans and things like that. And so I am um, I am thrilled to have you here to uh, to talk today. Thank you so much for having me. Really exciting to be here. Well, cool. I wanted to go ahead and start to talk to you about a uh, a diagnostic diagnostic test technique. Sorry, stumbling all over the place. I want to talk to you about a diagnostic technique that I started seeing uh, more and more about in the last probably three to six months, and it's the liquid biopsy technique. And so, uh, just I, can you go ahead and just start out at a really broad you know, scope. What is, what do you mean? What do we mean when we say liquid biopsy? What is this test? Yeah, liquid biopsy is essentially um, the ability to detect cancer, but instead of by taking a tissue biopsy, where you're actually taking a little piece of where the suspected cancer is, you're taking a uh, usually minimally invasive sample of a liquid that's easily accessible in the body. And so if you think about the different liquids that our patients have in their body, there's Blood is something that we're very used to collecting, um, but there's also other liquids like urine, effusions, some cerebral spinal fluid. So those are the other liquids that you could consider. And so liquid biopsy is essentially the sampling and analysis of biomarkers that are present in biological fluids in the body and usually can be sampled through minimally invasive means. Okay. So when I first heard the term liquid biopsy, I had this idea that when I was highly suspicious of uh, of a cancer or when I was like, I'm looking at a mass here, this would be a technique similar to normal biopsy where, you know, I see a problem area or area of concern and I sample it and I say, tell me what this is. But when I'm reading and learning about liquid biopsy, uh, it seems to me the great power in this test is the screening, the preemptive power of liquid biopsy. Can you, can you do? comment on that a little bit? Absolutely. I think that's one of the most exciting uses of liquid biopsy. So there's, there's kind of a, there's about six different kind of predefined uses of liquid biopsy and and screening is really the first one. Screening basically means using any sort of testing to try to identify disease in a healthy patient, in a healthy and asymptomatic patient, right? Where, Where disease is not yet suspected. And so when we specifically use this to detect cancer, we're thinking about an asymptomatic population of pets that, um, in this case, dogs that 
don't currently have symptoms. The veterinarian nor the family suspects cancer in this individual, but they're at higher risk of developing cancer, maybe because of their age or because of their breed. So this would be an ability to test these dogs that we know just get a lot of cancer. They tend to be at high risk for cancer. Uh, to try to identify cancer even before they start to show clinical signs. And that's just like people get, right? Like we get mammograms and PSA tests and colonoscopies all in an effort to try to find cancer earlier because we know there's treatment benefits to finding it earlier. Well, this is is the part that really speaks to me. And so this is what I get really excited about because we all have these pet owners who have lost uh, a, a boxer they're, they're, a box, they're a boxer family or they're a golden retriever family or they're a golden doodle family or they're what you know, like, but, and they have lost pets to cancer before and they are like, I don't ever want that again. I want, I want to be vigilant. I, you know, or I'm terrified of my, of my dog dying at a young age uh, of, you know, of, of cancer, which is really the number one cause of, of death in dogs. And so to me, being able to do a screening test seems like something that they are going to be very excited about when I when I talk about I'm talking about my my a clients too the ones who are like yep I'm going to do whatever whatever I can do to extend the life of my pet and so not being able to to talk to someone who has a, a either a high risk breed or they're getting into a high risk age group or it's just someone who just says I've had this experience before and I want to sleep soundly at night to me that sounds like a fantastic benefit to be able to offer and so that's really why I got so so amped up about about liquid biopsy L- let me bef- let me put a pin in that before we start to unpack it because I have a lot of questions about how viable and feasible that is but let's talk for a second about about the use of a different uh, a different kinds of fluids, and so um, one of, one of the things you brought up is you said you know you can sort of use you can use urine, you can use um, effusions, things like that. That that's not something I was really familiar with. Uh, are you saying that when we tap that cat's or that dog's abdomen, and uh, or you know we've got we've got this sort of persistent urinary tract infections over and over again that that we could potentially use fluids like that in order to do liquid biopsy and look for cancer detection. So specifically for urine, there already is a test, uh, and th- there's a test called the BRAF test uh, that's available through Antec, and that is a urine-based liquid biopsy, essentially, where you take a sample of that dog's urine and you send it in, and they look for a specific, um, basically, marker of cancer, and that is, um, it's pretty specific, meaning if you get a positive result, it's pretty likely that that's what that dog has, and so that's a that's an amazing test. I love that test. It's it's really changed the way that I think that we can manage, especially complicated cases that are just hard to get a diagnosis on um, to, to say, you know, d- is cancer present in this patient? Uh, the kind of the screening tests though, like the, the tests that, um, that are used to detect multiple cancers are really blood-based tests. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. That totally makes sense. All right. Well, let's, let's go, let's start to get into the screening a little bit. Can you give me um, sort of a high level of how valuable is a screening test for cancer? So um, talk to me a little bit about latency period in cancers and when we could start to potentially see signals flags in like a liquid biopsy, as opposed to when we normally see clinical presentation, how much time are we talking about here? So that's a great question. We don't, we don't truly know the exact answer in every cancer and especially for dogs like we know in people, I can tell you that cancer does not happen overnight. And even sure. even in those dogs where you see those super fast growing masses, like, I, like I've seen mast cell tumors that are doubling in size every 24 hours, right? And I'm sure we've all seen those that, that just are, are growing like, like, you know, just so fast. Um, however, the, the cellular changes that started, even what looks like a rapidly growing mass, have been present for a very long time. It's not something that literally has only been there for a matter of days or, or even weeks. In models of human cancer, it takes up to about 25 years to go from that initial abnormality in the DNA to becoming a clinical cancer syndrome that's recognized because of signs and symptoms. Now, we don't know what that kind of lag period is, but it's not a day and it's not 25 years. So it's somewhere in between. So, you know, in dogs, maybe it's a year, maybe it's two years, maybe it's six months and really aggressive disease. We, don't, we just don't know those answers yet, but it's really exciting to kind of uh, be able to figure that out and to know that there is a lag period. And what that means is that 
there is a period of time where cancer is truly present in the body at a molecular level, and it gives us a window to be able to detect it sooner. We, we know that when we talk about cancer, we're talking about a huge variety of problems that we kind of lump together into just cancer, right? And different types of cancer and things like that. Can you speak a little bit to the variability of different types of cancer and how it would in, uh, intersect with this? I mean, are there, are there cancers that sh- shed or, le- or, much, or shed less or much less harder to detect than others? Are there, um, are there cancers that liquid biopsy is better at finding than other types of cancers? Can you help, help me sort of uh, get my head around that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, not all cancers are kind of created equal when it comes to being able to be detected by liquid biopsy. Some are going to shed a lot of their biomarker into the blood, which makes it easy to detect. And some actually might shed their biomarker into a different liquid in the body. So I talked before about urinary tract tumors we think about where they are shedding their biomarker, they're going to be more likely to shed it into the urine than they are into the blood. And so uh, for specifically for when a urinary tract cancer is suspected, for example, uh, you might be better served by going directly after the urine rather than the blood. So, so there is some biologic difference there. Also, if you think about, you know, the blood brain barrier and cerebral spinal fluid and the the potential that that biomarker might not be as present at high levels in the blood for central nervous system tumors. So some of it is biologic. A lot of it is it has to do with biology and some of it just has to do with uh, with with size, like how much volume or quantity of tumor there is in the body kind of also means how much biomarker there is around and, and potentially how much there would be likely to be found in the blood. Yeah, I was, uh, I was looking at the Candid study, which uh, covers uh, a lot of stuff about liquid biopsy. And, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can, can check it out and, and download it. And it was talking about the, the sensitivity of sort of the main, uh, the main cancers that we see. So we're talking about the three most aggressive canine cancers are lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma and osteosarcoma. And, uh, and they were reporting a, an 85% detection rate on the big three. Does that kind of track with experiences that you've had or kind of what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, so the Candid study or the cancer detection in dog study was a, a really big effort that we performed at over 40 clinical sites around the world. We, uh, the study involves 1,100 dogs with and without cancer. And so in that study, for the dogs that had one of those three diagnoses, lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, or osteosarcoma, uh, the oncocanine liquid biopsy test was able to detect that cancer in 85% of those cases, which is just phenomenal because those are really the most aggressive cancers that we see in dogs. Well, lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma, you know, um, Bit pretty, pretty, pretty darn common, you know. And then when you start talking about, you know, your your breeds that are predisposed for 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 these specific cancers, uh, the value seems really high. I know a lot of Rottweiler owners that would a hundred percent love to screen for osteosarc on on the regular because they've gone through that experience of having osteosarcoma in one of their rotties. And um, yeah, when I when I just look at that, I go, oh, that, that seems pretty impressive. Yeah, I think there's there's so many breeds like that too, right? Like like the the people that are just really into their breeds, whether they're um their their dog show people or their breeders, or they just love the breed. Uh, when they love that breed and they're really really into it, and they they also know which breed, you know, if their breed gets a lot of cancer. So I think that they're, you know, it's one of the most common questions that I get as an oncologist is. What can I do to try to detect cancer earlier in my other pet after a family's kind of gone through cancer treatment? And so once they know about it in a, in a particular breed, then they, they really want to know what can they do to find it earlier. Well, it's that creeping dread. You know, you look at your dog every day and you say, this was the litter mate to yeah. my other dog who died of cancer. And they, they do, they chew their, their fingernails. And, um, and it's funny because, you know, we know that you could do a test and it could be negative in six months from now or a year from now, it might not be. But that belief that they have looked and there was nothing there when we looked, that's significant peace of mind for people. A hundred percent. Those exact words that I was going to use is peace of mind. And, um, you know, this, this test, when you, especially in the screening population, has a very high, and these are these are numbers that maybe as veterinarians we're not as used to kind of thinking about. But when you're thinking about if you've run a test on a patient and you want to know, well, how much can I trust the result of this test? 
you need to think about the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. And the negative predictive value when using it as a screening test is about 95 to 96%, meaning that's really good peace of mind when you've run it as a screening test, meaning this is an asymptomatic dog that you as a veterinarian do not suspect cancer in and you get a negative result, 95 to 96% chance that that dog does not have cancer. Yeah. That, yeah, that's that's really solid. And then flip it to the other side is to say, what are the chances? Because this gives me nightmares. I don't want to give somebody a false positive. I don't want to be like, oh, you know, oh, this, I'm sorry to tell you this. And then, you know, it it turns out, you know, it turns out that this was a false positive. So what, what are the probability of false positive? So the false positive rate in the study was only 1.5%, which is really, really right. low, meaning 1.5% of the dogs that enrolled at as um, presumably cancer-free dogs got a positive result. Um, and um, a few of those that ended up testing positive, we actually diagnosed cancer in. So we found cancer in some. Um, the, some of the others we ended up following, some of them were lost to follow-up. Some of them, unfortunately, had passed away before we kind of figured out what was going on. But when you look at the positive predictive value, so if you've run the test um, again, it depends on how you run it. If you run it as a screening test versus as an aid in diagnosis, meaning you did suspect cancer in this patient, then the positive predictive values are between about um, around 70% to about 96%, meaning that the majority of patients that do receive a positive result will in fact be found to have cancer. Talk to me a little bit about the benefits of catching these cancers early. So we talked about the sort of the the big three, lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma, sort of 85% um, uh, detection rate. And then when you look at the top eight most common cancers, uh, lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, osteosarcoma, soft tissue sarcoma, mast cell tumors, mammary gland carcinoma, anal sac adenocarcinoma, and malignant melanoma, the detection rate is, is about two-thirds. It's about it's 62%. And so a high detection rate, two, two-thirds of the time, they're going to detect cancer in those, in those eight common um, common um, types of types of tumors, types of cancer. Uh, what is the benefit of detection? Because I, I see, I can hear the words of some clients uh, saying back to me, well, I, I don't, I don't want to know, or what is the benefit of finding out early? And so as an oncologist, can you talk to me a little bit about the benefits of early detection uh, from, from a clinical standpoint? So from a veterinarian standpoint, I can tell you as well as from a client and a patient standpoint. From a veterinarian standpoint, I think about the diagnostic, what we call the diagnostic odyssey. This is like the period of time when you know something is going on with your patient. And depending on what the owner wants to do, it could take you two days to figure it out, or it could take you two months to figure it out, or it could take you six months because sometimes it's like, well, I just want to do conservative management. Okay, well, let's try an inset and come back in two weeks and let's recheck, or let's try you know, some liver support enzymes and come back in three weeks and we're going to recheck the lab work and see what's going on. And so by the time you get them to the point that they've decided what they want to do and do an ultrasound and figure out what's going on, maybe it's months down the road. And by this point, the disease has progressed. The dog is getting sicker. It's costing more money in the long run to actually figure it out. And they're not going to respond to treatment quite as well because they're now they're sick. When we figure out kind of earlier in the process, we sort of can take away a lot of that, those steps in the diagnostic odyssey. And what that means for us as veterinarians is we actually have more options to be able to share with families. And I don't know about you, but, and you, you have it different than I do as an oncologist. Usually I'm just meeting this family for the first time. Yeah. You've known this dog since they were a puppy. You've known this family for years, typically. And to have to then at the kind of 11th hour say your dog has a hemoabdomen, we've really only got two choices. Like you either can go to emergency surgery today, get a blood transfusion, do all of the things, or we have to consider euthanasia. Like that's a terrible thing to have to tell that family, right? And so if we can find it earlier before the hemoabdomen, for example, we as veterinarians have way more options we can talk to with the family about But it also means that the clients are not spending all that time and money on that diagnostic odyssey. They have more options to choose from and can choose what's actually right for them. They can do it on their own terms, not at the emergency hospital in the middle of the night. And then for the patients, if they're starting from a place where they feel healthier, 
they just have more likelihood to be able to respond better better to the therapy. So I think there's benefits for the vet and for the family as well as for the patient. No, that makes sense. Can can we get into the nitty gritty a little bit and kind of how it looks in practice? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Talk to me uh, about about handling and and technique and things like that. Uh, so I have a I have a patient in my treatment room right now. It's a nine year old golden retriever, and the owners say, "I don't know. You know, she's. I feel like she's losing some weight, mm-hmm. and her blood work looks normal. But I, you know, we're really concerned about this because of history we've had with other golden retrievers." Um, Walk me through that. What is that. What does that process look like for me to get the sample, to transport the sample, uh, and to get results? Yeah, so uh, veterinarians can get the Oncocanine test really one of three ways. They can get it directly from PetDX. So, so one thing that I should say is that the test is looking for fragments of DNA that are in the blood. And these fragments come from the actual tumor cells. Now, those fragments are very, very short-lived in the body. They only last for minutes to hours, so they have to be stabilized with a very special blood collection tube. So the tubes have to be provided. So that's the the first thing to know is that the tubes have to be provided, and so there's basically three ways to get the kit. Um, You can get it directly from PetDX, or you can get it through our diagnostic distributors like IDEX and Antec um, also have the test. And so those would be the ways you basically get the kit In the kit is everything that you need to pull the sample, which includes um, two blood collection tubes, as well as a vacutainer system to basically pull the blood directly from the vein right into the tube. Just like if you or I were to go to lab for today, that's what they would pull our blood with, right? It's just an an easy, quick way to kind of pull two tubes quickly. The volume in the tube um, does have to be above the minimum fill line on the tube, which is 7 ml. So the total tube volume on each tube is between 7 and 8.5 ml. So that's a total of 14 to 17 ml of blood. A little bit more than we're used to pulling for like a CBC Mm -hmm. chem, for example. But if you do kind of calculations using um, circulating blood volume, this is a safe quantity to pull on the vast majority of the patients that we see down to around a two kilogram body size. That totally makes sense. Okay, so um, so that answers my questions on handling things like that. What's the turnaround time on a test like this, Andy? Is this, um, yeah, just uh, when when I send this away and the pattern goes, when are we going mm-hmm. to know something? I, of course, I, I want help set me up for success. Give me some reasonable, realistic expectations, maybe a little bit of a cushion, uh, just because we're so busy uh, in the summertime, eh? you know, things like that. So uh, help me get my head around what kind of time frame are we talking about? Yeah. So what's nice is that um, the, the, these, I, I think these are like magic blood collection tubes. They stabilize the blood sample for seven days and they do it at room temperature. So you don't need to fuss around with refrigeration, nice. freezing, finding ice packs, all of that sort of thing. You literally just pop it back in the kit or you hand it off to the IDEX or Antec courier. They take care of the rest. Uh, and the turnaround time from the time, and it gets overnighted to our lab. So we generally get it about 24 hours later. And then it's about, uh, right now we're at about 10 to 11 day turnaround time. But generally under 12 days, calendar days, you're going to get a result back. That's that's excellent. That's that's excellent. Um what is the, again, just ballpark price point, you know, because that's something that's, that's going to come up. Is this a thousand dollar test? Is this, uh, and I'm talking about what, the, what, what I would end up presenting to the pet owner. And I know that that varies with the practice and the region, a million different things. I just want to try to get my head generally around kind of ballpark. What are, what are we talking about from the pet owner experience? So like a thousand dollar test, a $500 test, uh, a $200 test, kind of, kind of where are we in there? Yeah. So, um, it's, as you said, it's totally up to the, each practice in terms of, um, that's up to them in terms of setting what the price is. What we're finding is that the majority of practices are selling it to pet owners at around the five hundred dollar mark. Okay, and that, and that 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 makes sense, and that that feels right to me as far as as you know the the sensitivity and specificity of the test, and 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 what kind of pet owners are going to be wanting this, and what situations we'll be using it in. Do you have any final? pearls, words of wisdom for me, best practices on um, on introducing a liquid biopsy into a practice in, in communicating it to the team, to getting uh, to getting the staff on board with kind of doing this and using it. Uh, anything like that that would help me as, as a general practice doctor take this into my practice and, and get good results with it and make it a good experience for people who are not as fired up about it as I am. Yeah, I think there's a, a few things. So one is to think about using it as a screen test. 
what we're seeing a lot of practices do is either roll it into a geriatric yearly screening um, kind of panel mm-hmm. that they do, either that's breed specific or just for any dogs that are over the age of seven, because we know that dogs over the age of seven have a nine times higher risk of developing cancer. Um, the other thing that they're doing that we're seeing a lot of clinics doing is screening days where they'll have a cancer screening day and then they just have families sign up and they come in and they get um, an onco canine test, whatever, maybe they do some imaging as well, like they have an ultrasonographer there and they kind of have this day set aside um, as a as a cancer screening day. So they're really kind of selling this message of let's be proactive and try to find cancer earlier for those families that are really interested in that. I think that's something interesting that we're seeing out there. I, I think that's really neat. I, I, always, I always geek out about different ways to raise awareness of issues and making a certain day and saying, guys, this is important and we're doing it this time. I, I, I like that. What a neat educational approach. Yeah. And then the other way that um, the test can be used is as an aid in diagnosis. So this isn't a, a patient for which you do suspect cancer. Like you mentioned that poster child, nine-year-old golden retriever that's losing a little weight, but it's like, I don't mm-hmm. what, what is going on with this pet? It's not super clear. Um, or you've got um, a, a dog with a lameness and an aggressive bone lesion on radiographs, or you've got you know, you can see a mass on imaging, like on radiographs, but it's just, it's a challenging location to get to in the body. So this is where liquid biopsy can be used to identify, is this cancer versus is this something else on my list? So kind of help to narrow down that differential list and help the family understand what might be going on so that you can kind of direct that diagnostic workup a bit more quickly. Are there any pitfalls I should look out for? Are there are there rookie mistakes that you see vets uh, or vet techs making their first time out? Yeah, I would say if um, if you think about small localized skin and subcutaneous tumors that are accessible as a veterinarian, you're always going to get more information from a direct tissue biopsy than a liquid biopsy. So if you can reach it to aspirate it, definitely do that. Liquid biopsy is not meant to replace that. It's really what liquid biopsy, I think, is really the most useful for are the things that you can't reach, the things that you don't yet know about, the things that you're unsure of, if it's something else, anything within the body, in the chest, in the abdomen, in the nasal cavity, things like that, that you either know there's a mass or you suspect there could be a mass. That's where it excels. But the small localized skin tumor, like we like we have um, examples of, well, here's a dog that has a mass and they do a liquid biopsy and it's negative, but then they take it off and it's a mast cell tumor. And this was like a you know six millimeter mass. And that's not yeah. where, because of the size and the amount of biomarker around, it's not going to be a kind of tumor where there's going to be as much of detection with liquid biopsy. You're always going to uh, get more information from a direct like FNA, for example, or, or actually taking that off and submitting for biopsy than a liquid biopsy. Dr. Andy Flory, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your insight. This has been hugely helpful. Oh, good. Well, it was great to be here. And and, um, I'm excited to kind of just see veterinarians benefiting from this. And just it's exciting to think about earlier cancer detection and what it can mean for our patients. I agree. I, uh, that's that's the thing that that really got me excited about this is is when you talk about latency and the things you know the the insidious weight loss that we see in senior pets. And I go, man, if we could catch that, especially if we have um, if we have clients who are willing to go to see uh, the oncologist and 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 will consider chemotherapy. And I have more and more and more clients that are open to talking about those things if they feel like there's a reason to do them, if they feel like they're catching it early and they can make a significant difference. And I go, man, this is this is a, a possibility for us to, to one, to, to do some good screening and, and make a difference and really add quality lifespan to, to these uh, to these dogs that are that are dying of cancer. And then number two, this is a, a customer service uh, that we can offer that we couldn't offer before. And I, I just, I really believe that, you know, as veterinarians, we sell peace of mind as much as anything else. And we should stop. Um, we should stop apologizing for beautiful senior wellness blood works that come back. Like, don't apologize for that. That's wonderful. That's what we want. And, and everybody can relax. And we've got this great knowledge and that everything is fine. And I just, I, I would like to see us being able to do more and more of that stuff. So anyway, this makes me super excited. Andy, where can people learn more about liquid biopsy and PetDX? Oh, great. Yeah, they can uh, head over to our website, which is PetDX.com. 
There we've got links to all of our peer-reviewed studies. We've got case studies, so you can kind of check out how veterinarians are using it in the real world. And one exciting new tool that we just developed is called the Cancer Safe Tool, which stands for Screening Age for Early Detection. There, you as a veterinarian or your pet parents can go and enter their pet's breed and uh, weight and figure out when should I be starting cancer screening in my particular pet. Very nice. I'll put that link down in the show notes uh, along with with the uh, candid study. Thank you for being here. Guys, everybody, thanks for tuning in and, and listening. I hope you got a lot out of this. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Andy. Lovely to be here. And that's our episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks again to Pet DX for making this possible ad free. I, um, guys, if you have questions for me, shoot us an email. The email address is podcast at drandyrourke.com. That's podcast at drandyrourke.com. I, uh, I'm glad that you guys are here and I'm hoping to talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>